Global Arbitration by Professor Dr. Stephen Kroll, organized by the Center for Arbitration and Research, MNLU Mumbai, and Indian Review of Ar International Arbitration. International arbitration is a crucial mechanism for resolving disputes between parties from different countries without resorting to traditional court litigation. It plays a vital role in the globalized world by providing a fair, efficient and neutral forum to settle conflicts that arise in cross-border transactions and international business relationships. The importance of international arbitration lies in its ability to foster confidence in international business transactions, promote international trade and encourage peaceful resolution and dis of disputes in a globalized world, contributing to economic growth and stability. To deliver the welcome address, I would like to invite Chirag Balian, Assistant Professor, Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. Chirag Balian is a founding faculty at MNLE Mumbai and the founding and founding editor in chief of Indian Review of International Arbitration. He heads the Arbitration Center at the university. Apart from his LLM, he also has two two years masters in mediation and conflict resolution. He has authored books such as Commercial Arbitration. Specialized Arbitration, Investment Arbitration, etc. He is the Program Director of the Mediation and Arbitration course at the University. He was conferred with the Outstanding ADR Educator Award by Asia Pacific Center for Arbitration and Mediation. He regularly speaks at conferences and workshops on arbitration and mediation. Sir, I invite you to deliver the welcome address. Uh, thank you, Darshana. It is my pleasure to Post Professor Dr. Stephen Kroll for the fifth IRARB Distinguished Lecture on International Arbitration. Uh, Professor Kroll does not need an introduction. He is a leading academic arbitrator. He is very popular, not just amongst the professionals, amongst his clients, but also amongst the students because of the great work he is doing since 2012, if I'm not wrong, with the WIS Moot Court competition. So we started Indian Review of International Arbitration in the year 2020, and we had set up Center for Arbitration and Research in 2019. We were the first research institute in India to prepare a guide on virtual arbitration, how to navigate virtual arbitration, it is available and we keep on making policy interventions at the international as well as national level. The aim of our center as well as journal is to make sure that whatever reforms are happening in arbitration, they must be informed by research and are informed and guided I words like me. It is with this intention we are hosting fifth lecture in this series. The first lecture was delivered by Professor Julian, then Mr. Kevin Kim delivered the lecture, then we had Shan Bao, then Professor Jeffrey Winsima, and then your good self is grazing the occasion of distinguished lecture series in international arbitration. As a journal, since 2020, we are making consistent efforts to make sure there, there is a thorough peer review process and each and every article which is published is double blind peer reviewed. There are many good journals in arbitration, but our journal is an open access journal. We do not charge our, part, our people who author with us at any point of time, it's completely free and it will always be free. So the idea is knowledge of arbitration must be democratic. It shouldn't be just with few individuals or few publishers. And that's why support of experts like you is very valuable because then our uh, participants, our audience can through our journal, can, can learn from you, can gauge insights from experts like you. So with that intention and that background, we do this Indian Review of International Arbitration. I again sincerely welcome you. It is a privilege. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Darshana, over to you. Thank you, sir. 
next we move to the distinguished lecture professor dr stephen crawl is professor at bucerius law college hamburg and the director of its center for international dispute resolution he is the president of the german arbitration institute and member of the international advisory board of the arbitration institute of the finland chamber of commerce since 2012 he is the director of the william sevis arbitration moot court in addition he is a visiting professor at the school of international arbitration at the center for commercial law studies queen mary university of london as an independent arbitrator he has sat in more than 90 arbitrations involving private parties as well as state parties ancetral has retained him as one of the three experts to prepare the digest on the modern law on international commercial arbitration stephen crawl has been a visiting fellow at nyu school of law and cambridge university professor stephen has various publications to his credit sir it's a pleasure to have you here with us today and i leave i uh, request you to address the participants so asana thank you very much and shirak thank you very much for that very kind introduction and also for inviting me i very much share your uh, efforts and beliefs that we have to spread the knowledge about arbitration uh, to make it also accessible to everyone who wants it and that's one of the uh, one of the aims of the bismuth as well yeah and that is one of the reasons why we do that that we spread and educate uh, young arbitration practitioners uh, which take benefit of the education and then also basically with that knowledge help international business and also the society at large so let me share my screen with you uh, if that works um, today's topic i hope you can see it i see you nodding okay today's topic is arbit corruption arbitration proceedings the past the present and the future when i selected that topic the first thing i was did i went to my private library and had a look what was already written on the topic and that is just the books i found in my private library i'm not talking about the university library of the last 6 years so you can see the relevance of the topic uh, when we start with the first one catherine betts it was from 2017 has a text of 330 pages then the other two from this year, um, Emmanuel Obiora Igwokwe, I hope I spelled the pronounce the name correctly, 360, and Yagmo Hotoglu, 622 pages. So there's a lot to be said about corruption and arbitration. And uh, I was now had the choice of what do I do with that lecture? Do I say very much about basically nothing or do I say nothing about very much? And I hope I found um, an option to have it a little bit of both, say a little bit about a lot of things. Um, so what is the agenda? I would like first to discuss very shortly the backgrounds, corruption, facts and consequences uh, to also give you a an indication of why it's so important that we have stringent um, approaches there. And then to explain that, I will take three different cases, characteristic cases in arbitration, one fairly old one, and the other two are typical situations or the two typical situations where corruption arbitration may come up. And from then on, I will discuss with this past, present, future approach, uh, certain issues which are of relevance, jurisdictional issues, arbitrability of corruption cases and separability, then which law has been applied or should be applied by the arbitrators, evidential particularities, the fact finding of the arbitral tribunal, and last but not least, um, controlled by the state courts, public policy, and there may be issues concerning enforcement against state parties. We may discuss that in the Q&A. Let me first come to the corruption factual background 
We have Transparency International, which every year produces a corruption perception index, and that is the corruption perception index concerning the public sector corruption. So I'm not talking about private sector corruption uh, with that map, it's just the public sector corruption. Um, and you will see that uh, it goes from red to yellow, and the more red it is, the higher is the corruption. And we look at the map, unfortunately, a lot of it is in red. And uh, that involves states where corruption has been, and the dark red ones, nearly endemic. And this public sector corruption also gives you at least some indications what private sector does. So there is a whole, a whole tendency or a whole um, environment of corruption, which not only affects the public sector, but uh, goes into the private sector as well. And again, when you look at that, you see that corruption is primarily strong in developing countries. So the developed countries, for some extent, have dealt a little bit better with corruption, not sufficiently, but a little bit better at least. And when you look at, again, at the most corrupt countries, a lot of them are resource rich countries. And the frustrating part is that very often these resource rich countries are among the poorest countries in the world. When we take a closer look at the bottom and the top countries, you will see that the top all include countries of high income. And there is definitely an interrelation between corruption, the fight against corruption, and economic development. And when you look at the bottom, you see that there are primary failed states. Somalia, civil war all the time. South Sudan, newly founded civil war. Syria, completely destroyed. Yemen, North Korea, all countries which are not known for, their, for the worlds of the people there. And then you have Venezuela in between, which is also one of the very rich, in principle, very rich countries where you have people now starving due to the problems they have in the system. India is ranked fairly in the middle uh, with a, uh, it's ranked 85 and uh, has been stable, fairly stable around a score of 40, which is a little bit below what uh, the average is. And when you look at the, at the uh, figures, the in economic figures, there was an IMF study about the effects of corruption and their finding was that government or the least corrupt government at least collect 4% more in taxes from their, from their people have more money to spend. And the estimated benefit of fighting corruption is approximately 1.2 of the global GDP um, just lost due to corruption in relation to taxes. And there was another survey by the uh, UN Department of um, Crime, and they estimate in 2025 that in Africa, approximately 25% of the GDP is lost due to corruption. So it is something which is endemic in a number of countries and where you have not only the two parties affected, but the entire country. And I've done a lot of work for the German government, the US government uh, concerning the rule of law. If you would ask me what I would have to extinguish to foster development, it would be corruption. Unfortunately, with the pandemic, it has gone worse a little bit. Yeah? With all the crisis now, we have in principle just two countries which are very active in enforcement, and these are the United States and Switzerland. Then you have a number of countries which have a moderate enforcement and a lot of countries with limited or no enforcement whatsoever of even the obligations, international obligations they have agreed to under the UN Convention on Combating Crime or the OECD Convention. So naturally that also affects arbitration or affects disputes arising in arbitration. And there are two basic scenarios. 
The first one concerns investment arbitration. And investment arbitration, which will not be the primary focus of my, you have two cases where allegations of corruption will always rise. You have very often a change of government, and then there is immediately an annulment of contracts which have been concluded by the old government. In particular, in countries where you have endemic corruption, uh, the new government wants to basically give out some of the contracts which have already been given out by the old government to their cronies, uh, excuse the word here, and um, the old government has not given contract out on basis of what is good for the country, but whom they know. At the same time, you have also governments coming in which are really faced by illegal investments, yeah, where someone outsider has tried to take advantage of the old government's corruption and invested something uh, by bribing the government. And that is an issue concerning the jurisdiction of the tribunal. But my focus will be on the three cases of commercial arbitration. So when we deal with commercial arbitration, we have on the one hand contracts obtained by corruption. Uh, and I will give you an example. Um, and it actually comes, it will be an Indian example. I go to that in greater detail in a moment. The second one is more the contract, which is actually for corruption. It's very often intermediaries which are paid to basically grease the wheel or largely pay bribes to government official or private official. And last but not least, there's also corruption in the arbitral process. That there have been instances, uh, there have been instances where arbitrators have disclosed information to parties um, during the process, and where the parties were available or were had the chance of submitting additional information to the tribunal. And there were even cases, high-profile cases where arbitrators took submissions drafted by the parties and gave them to the tribunal as alleged own drafts of that. That is rare, but there has been high profile case of that. And there's also arbitrations which where the award was based on a document which subsequently found out was found out to be forged or was found out to be illegal. Let me give you three cases as an example for the subsequent discussions addressing uh, contracts obtained by corruption and payment to third parties by intermediary. And they are very good. They provide you with scenarios uh, which show also a little bit the development, what happened. And let me start with the earliest one. And nearly every lecture, book, whatever on corruption starts with that famous ICC case by Judge Lagergren. And in that case, that was ICC case number 1100 from 90, where the decision was rendered in 1963. We had a company in the UK, a mother company, and they had a subsidiary and they approached uh, Mr. X in Argentina for power generation projects. And he was fairly closely connected to the then Peron government in 1950 and agreed to support um, the British company in their efforts to get that contract. Both projects in which he was involved didn't work out. Then where the, Peron, the government of Mr. Peron was overthrown in 55. And then the English company um, obtained another project. It was the mother company which formed a joint venture with other companies and they obtained in 58 a large project of 23 million uh, plus uh, pounds, British pounds. That project has been much larger than the previous projects, but Mr. X in the meantime, no longer in Argentina because he was very close to the uh, government of Mr. Peron and fled the country, wanted to have his share on that one. And he alleged that under the contract, the agency contract, as it was called, uh, he was entitled to the share. And that is 
famous because La Judge Lagergrain approached it from an approach we wouldn't take today. But it's also famous because a lot of the findings of Judge Lagergrain, you could, could subscribe to them today, and the problems have not really changed too much. And I just want to quote one part of that from Judge Lagergrain in the arbitration uh, initiated by Ms. X. He stated concerning the consequences of that, that the amounts paid have a destructive effect on the business pattern and the consequent impairment of industrial progress. We were talking about Argentina there, which after the Second World War was one of the richest countries in the world. By now, they are basically stumbling from one insolvency to the next one. And that is in part due to the endemic corruption they have in that country and the corruption very often fostered by governments which try to protect themselves and basically make sure that when they're in power, they get their share. The second case is a much more modern case and it concerns the same type of contract. And it's the case between Alexander Brothers and Alstom. Um, and here we had again a consultancy agreement submitted to Swiss law and providing for arbitration in Geneva, which Alstom concluded with Alexander Brothers for three railway project in China. In the end, all three contracts were awarded to Alstom. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that every consultancy agreement or every agency agreement is involving bribery, because a lot of these cases, a lot of these contracts, you need someone on, on the place to tell you how to operate, how to submit your tender documents, what is required. And it's a normal, normal feature of business that you rely on people on the ground in particular countries. So Alexander Brothers was supposed to be one of those. And what happened then was Alstom had two previous agreements with them, which didn't materialize. The third one materialized then. And when they were about to pay, they paid 55% under the first contract, 80% for the second contract, and refused to pay for the third contract. And the reason for that was that Alstom by the time had been under corruption investigations for other projects completely unrelated to that by the US and UK authorities. And in that they are often submitted to requirements concerning their internal organization and to prevent corruption there. And Alstom said due to the internal measures they were no longer allowed to pay, uh, avoiding without the threat of being seriously uh, penalized because their ethic and compliance policy would be violated. And the problem was that Alexander Brothers could not really submit proof of the work they had done. <coughs> it was no allegation there that Alstom gave Alexander Brothers the money to bribe it, but there were allegations that Alexander Brothers nevertheless took some of the money they received to bribe Chinese officials. So Alexander Brothers then brought a claim for the outstanding invoices, damages and punitive damages for damages to its reputation. In the end, the tribunal awarded 1 million for the 1.5 million for the first two contracts. And the funny thing was under the contract, Alexander Brothers had to provide proof that they were doing something and what they have been doing, and they hadn't done so. Nevertheless, the tribunal came to the conclusion that since Alstom had paid 55% and 80% under the first two contracts, that requirement was tacitly abandoned. So they awarded the remaining amount for the first two. The third contract, the wording was a little bit more stringent. No payment had been made and payment the, was rejected by the tribunal. Alstom then tried to have the award annulled in Switzerland, alleging that it's contrary to public policy. 
And it's interesting to look at the allegations and the decision of the Swiss tribunal. The Swiss tribunal said, first of all, we are bound by the findings of the arbitral tribunal. And the arbitral tribunal came to the conclusion there was no bribery corruption proven. And here there's no risk of criminal prosecution anymore because everything is already out there. It has nothing to do with new facts and everything is in the arbitration file. So if you are ordered to pay, they cannot see you. And then they looked at the public policy bribery, said no findings by the tribunal. But then the main argument of Alstom had been that the payment ordered would no longer be consistent with Alstom internal compliance rule. And there was a threat to criminal sanctions if they would not comply with their own compliance rules. So they said, largely, we concretized the public policy fighting against bribery by having internal rules at the company law level at the company level meaning that our compliance rules are there to enforce the overarching goal of public policy fighting corruption and since we would act against our own policy rules that is contrary to public policy the swiss tribunal came to the conclusion that yes fighting corruption is public policy but it's not done by private rules. They are not part of public policy. Otherwise, it would be too easy for everyone to basically have its own rules as part of public, public policy. So what happened then, they started also enforcement actions in the UK and France. And in the UK, the courts had no problem with that. In France, the Court of Appeal originally refused enforcement. They came to the conclusion by looking at a number of factors, there were so many red flags for corruption that they considered enforcement of the award contrary to public policy. In the end, the Court de Cassation annulled that decision and declared the award enforceable. And the last case I would like to discuss, and now we're moving closer to India, relates to contracts obtained by corruption or allegedly by corruption. And that's the case Devers versus Antrix, which may be familiar to a number of you. What happened in that case, it started all in 2003. There was an American consultancy firm who approached Antrix, the commercial uh, branch of the uh, Indian Space Agency, and made certain suggestions um, under a memorandum of, a, a memorandum of understanding to evaluate and implement major new satellite applications. And their proposal in 2004 was that there should be a joint venture formed, which should provide digital enhanced video and audio services. And <coughs> Andrix was supposed to invest in an operational s band satellite and lease it then to the joint venture for 15 years for around 11 million. At the end of 2004 in December, this joint venture was founded, Devas India, and directly a month later, it got awarded an agreement without a public tender. And under that agreement, Andrix was supposed to build and operate the two satellites and rent out largely 90%, 90 plus percent of the space to Devas for the digital broadcasting services. In 2011, then, the contract was terminated by Antrix. They had realized that largely, or well, by the time it had become apparent that how valuable these bands were, and that the contract may not have been very favorable for Antrix. But the contract was terminated for force majeure because India decided, the government of India decided not to use the s -band for commercial purposes, but reserve it for public purposes. I was told primary military services. So since they made that decision, the s was not available. Antrix tried to rely on the force majeure clause in the contract and uh, terminated the contract. As a consequence, Devas then initiated arbitration proceedings, ICC arbitration proceedings after the termination, and in the end got awarded 
562 million US dollars uh, in an ICC award of 2015. However, by 2015, also the Indian authorities had started investigating into Devas and that investigation led to a first report in 2015, where it was said that Devas was set up for fraudless purposes. And the national, subsequently there was an, uh, something initiated, a procedure initiated under the Companies Act and the National Company Law Tribunal in the end winded up, ordered the winding up of Devas for under section 271C of the Companies Act. And that winding up, which was ordered in 2021, was confirmed in 2022 at the final stage by the Indian Supreme Court. And the winding up, plus the finding there that, that Devas was allegedly founded for uh, fraud purposes, then formed the basis of an annulment of the award, the ICC award in Delhi by the High Court of Delhi. So the award was set aside. But at the same time, Devas also had shareholders. And one of the shareholders was the Deutsche Telekom through its Singapore subsidiary, and there were Mauritius entities. And they took the termination and the other things as a basis for starting bid arbitration against India. And India lost the bid arbitrations, and there are now enforcement proceedings pending in Europe and the United States for this bid arbitration against India, where again India tries to defend itself, uh, alleging that there has been corruption involved. And there had been a decision by the German, uh, the court in Germany for recognition enforcement that the award has been declared enforceable in Germany at the beginning of this year. So these are the three cases. Now let's go to the question, what does corruption, or how does corruption affect arbitration? And let's go back to the past, the ICC case, Judge Lagergren. And in the case, Judge Lagergren, and I have put the important quote on the, on the slide here, Judge Lagergren came to the conclusion, the parties both affirmed the binding effects of their contract, including the binding effect of the arbitration agreement, and asked the arbitrator to decide the case. Because this was a clear-cut case where someone was supposed to use his influence to pay bribes. So the parties had an interest also to have that dealt with in arbitration and not by a state court out in the public. But Judge Lagergren, after coming to the conclusion that yes, there is an arbitration agreement, there's a, there's a valid, the parties want me to do that, said these type of contract condemned by public decency and morality, I cannot in the interest of due administration of justice avoid examining the question of jurisdiction on its own motion. So though his jurisdiction was never challenged, he said as an arbitrator, I have to act on my own motion and look at my jurisdiction. And then he came to the conclusion that parties who ally themselves in an enterprise of the present nature, meaning trying to bribe government officials, must realize that they have forfeited any right to ask for assistance of the machinery of justice in settling their dispute. So in principle, he said, these type of disputes are not arbitrable. You cannot bring them to arbitration. That was a unique statement because since then, I'm not aware of any case where an arbitrator, first of all, looked at its jurisdiction on its own motion, though none of the parties challenged its jurisdiction, and then came to the conclusion, these cases are not arbitrable. That was the past. In the present, the attack is not so much on the arbitrability of a dispute, it's now largely accepted that fraud disputes can be arbitrated, but it's more on the validity of the arbitration agreement. Fortunately, the validity of the arbitration agreement is largely protected by the doctrine of separability. 
that the main contract is has been obtained by bribery, let's take the Devas example, is not affecting the arbitration agreement included in it. And there's this famous uh, case by the uh, UK Supreme Court, Fiona Trust versus Pribalov, where they said also the allegation that you would have never entered into a contract but for the bribery. And that means also that you have never entered into the arbitration agreement but for the bribery is not sufficient. There must be fraud or bribery directly relating to the arbitration agreement. So meaning, for example, you normally do not enter into arbitration agreement. That's the first time you entered into an arbitration agreement and that was just due to the bribery. In the majority of cases, you want to obtain the main contract through bribery, but the arbitration agreement as such is not affected by that. Sometimes, and that was this year's moot court case, you have cases where parties try to resist, in particular state parties try to resist arbitration by saying to submit to arbitration in these type of contracts, we need not only the authorization or not only signature of one minister, but we need authorization by parliament or by other institutions, government institutions, and that authorization had not been given at the time of contracting. And again, you have in certain jurisdiction actually rules, including in the European Convention on Arbitration, which says state parties at least cannot rely on internal requirements to avoid their obligation to arbitrate uh, if they have entered into a contract. Um, it can be assumed that they know what they're doing and it's part of the sovereign exercise of the sovereign authority that they enter into that arbitration. So I think here again, we will have also in the future, very few chances that governments or parties succeed with that. Where they may succeed um, and is that when we deal with contract procured by corruption, they may perhaps try to argue, and you've seen that more and more, that the contract is not covered. To some extent, you have that already in investment arbitration, when it says the protection, the BIT, plus the arbitration agreement included in the BIT covers only legal investment. The moment there is an illegal investment obtained by corruption, then the tribunal lacks jurisdiction. However, also in private contracts, you may have arguments which could be based or could run along that way when I submitted to arbitration, I wanted to submit all disputes arising under the contract to arbitration, but I never wanted to submit contracts or disputes involving corruption to arbitration. I never expected you to bribe my officials entering into the contract. And we had these type of arguments which were run successfully in a completely different area in the European Court of Justice concerning post cartel damage claims. And when <coughs> parties try to bring actions in the state courts for post cartel damages, and the other party tried to invoke the arbitration agreement, um, the courts came to the conclusion, yes, you have submitted to arbitration all disputes, but you were only anticipating disputes concerning or with a party which behaved reasonably. You were not anticipating disputes with a party which basically defrauded you because they had entered into a cartel before. And this jurisprudence, at least in relation to forum selection agreement, has been supported by the European Court of Justice. So I'm fairly sure that we will see these type of arguments in the future. Let me come to the next issue, the application of the relevant laws. Go to the, back to the past, Judge Lagergren had to deal with the issue because the parties also said you cannot refuse jurisdiction because that the offense, the bribery would be against foreign public policy, but not against French public policy. So at the time in 63, 
in particular in a lot of developing and capital export uh, exporting countries corruption of foreign government officials was not a crime was not against public policy in germany it was prohibited but it was tax deductible so if i bribed a government official outside it was until 10 years ago tax deductible as a kind of um, money needed to do business that fortunately has at least on paper changed we have now a number of international two international conventions the OECD convention combating bribery of foreign public officials in international business transaction we have the UN convention against corruption from 2003 and we have a number of national laws and Perhaps you remember that I said one of the very few countries strictly, very strictly enforcing anti-bribery laws is the United States, which was also one of the first countries which had a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And that is really a major sword. And funnily enough, under these and comparable acts, for example, FIFA was prosecuted and Blatter had to leave the head of FIFA because of this act. India also has a prevention of, prevention of Corruption Act since 1988, and also the UK Bribery Act, which is also a very strict one, was initiated in 2010. So in principle, you can say we have now transnational principles that we agree all that corruption of government officials, but also of private parties is against public policy. And then you remember Alstom, had to implement own rules at the company level. And very often these own rules are basically forced upon them due to actions by the enforcement authorities under the S Foreign Crop Practice Act or under the UK Bribery Act. They were the one who imposed not only a fine upon Alstom, but also requested them to have that policies. The problem, however, is that bribery clearly is contrary to public policy, but most of the cases are at the borderline of consultancy agreement, ordinary consultancy agreement, like in the um, Alstom case, or trading in influence, and also trading in influence may not be prohibited everywhere. So you hire someone for his or her good connections with the government, so where does trading and influence end and where does bribery start? And where does that deviate from ordinary consultancy agreement? So you also hire a consultancy firm, local consultancy firm for its connections in that jurisdiction. So there is a line which is the line which will be now and in the future be probably one of the main battlefields in arbitration for arbitrators. And it's becoming one of the more, it is one of the main battlefields because, and now I'm coming to the, one of the most important parts, the evidentiary problems we have here. Again, looking back at Judge Lagergren at the past when he said, describing that said, as might be expected, the documents drawn up seem on their face to be legal, an ordinary agency agreement and be the semblance of ordinary commercial documents. And here he came to the conclusion that yes, he may have had certain functions, but the general image is that here we have someone who was hired to pay, to receive money and to pay to government officials. But that is never clearly spelled out. They all look on their face to be legal and semblance ordinary commercial documents. So as an arbitrator, it's very difficult to rely on documents, to rely on something in writing. So there are a number of problems you're facing today and you will also probably face in the future. The first one is the difficulties in proving that there was actually fraud or corruption involved. That's normally a secret activity and you don't have documents. So there's no direct evidence available. You may have to rely on indirect evidence certain red flags, and we come to that in a moment. On the other hand, 
allegations of corruptions are a serious crime. So he is alleged that someone inv was involved in serious criminal activities. And normally, whenever you try to penalize someone for criminal activities, the standard of and the proof is fairly high. So we have an issue there, and let me go to that in a moment. The second issue is the burden of proof. There, it's not so difficult. It's still the party who invokes corruption who has to prove it. There is no change in the allocation of the burden of proof. However, there may be alleviations in the burden of proof under burden of proof rules. So for example, it is very difficult for someone to prove that something didn't happen. So you may ask the other party to actually allege that there had been a payment made and then require the other party to say or to bring proof because they are having or in a better possession to deal with that, that no such payments were made. And then coming back to the first thing I mentioned, the standard of proof. Um, there, are, there are arguments fighting for a lower standard, problem with no direct evidence available, and there are arguments in favor of a high standard. It's a serious allegation, close to a crime. And last but not least, you may have different standards by the different courts. Uh, they apply and courts will have to ask yourself, what is the standard of my conviction here? So when we look at that, look at the standard of proof, which is one of the crucial issues. You have the 50-50. Above 51, the balance of probabilities is in favor of of uh, corruption. That is the one end of the spectrum, the minimum. And the other one is the full conviction. As an arbitrator, I must be fully convinced that there was proof. And in between, you have a number of other ones in private issues, but in criminal cases, you have even beyond reasonable doubt because it is a criminal case and the standard may be higher. So the question then arises, which one do we apply? As an arbitrator, but also as a court dealing with questions subsequently of recognition and enforcement of awards. And that differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And my prediction is a little bit that in the end, in, for arbitral tribunals, we will probably end up with uh, one preponderance evidence or close to balance of probabilities. Because bribe and corruption is such a serious allegation, doing such a harm to a worldwide economy that arbitrators should be strict on these issues and take into account that it's difficult to prove that. I'm not sure that we need beyond reason, or I'm fairly sure that beyond reasonable doubt will not be the correct standard in the future. And again, let me give you a quote from one of the famous cases now from the investment side, dealing with that problem. It's difficult to prove corruption by direct, direct evidence, the same may be circumstantial. However, in that case, they came where the evidence must be clear and convincing, meaning probably between full conviction and the second one, preponderance, clear preponderance of evidence. So it's not a mere preponderance, but it's a clear preponderance of evidence. That is the one they have adopted in that case. Now let's look at the red flags. And there are a number of red flags which indicate perhaps that contracts such as the in the Alstom case may be not consultancy agreements but actually agreements to pay bribes. The first one is the commission is extraordinarily high and disproportionate to the services rendered. Second 
the nature and the manner in which the service rendered are unexplained or suspicious. And you remember that under the Alstom contract, they originally had a requirement that you had to basically uh, prove or at least list the services rendered. So there was already something in the contract which tried to prevent that there was in the end a problem with allegations of bribery. And Alexander Brothers could not fulfill it. They had hardly anything documented what they did. The only thing they had, and I come to that in a moment, was two documents which they obtained, but which were doubtful or probably illegally obtained. And again, very often you have problems describing the services you rendered, apart from saying, I provided the necessary contracts. You have also the structure of the agent may play a role. If you have an agency which is established worldwide, have a clear structure, clear hierarchical structure, clear guidance, one, there is not a problem. If you have someone who is a one-off one -off company set up for something just for that particular business, the red flags are there. And last but not least, the pervasiveness of corruption in the host state. To some extent, that is one which gives you a little bit a problem that to some extent, a host state for not getting its act together may rely on its own probability or own problems create or the problems created by it subsequently to be in a better position to prove corruption than a host state which has gotten its act together and has fought corruption strongly. What were the issues which drove the Court of Appeal in Paris and Alexander Brothers to come to the conclusion this, contra this award should not be enforced? There was limited evidence of services provided, as I said, just two documents. There was a completely disproportionality of services and payment. So there was never an allegation that Alstom actually paid money to bribe, but the amount they paid was so high that Alexander Brothers could easily use some of that to uh, basically bribe officials. And Alexander Brothers was a very small venture. So there was not a lot of capital or material resources. Second thing was the general behavior. Alexander Brothers was not considered to be someone who always stuck to the law. The same applied to Alstom. So Alexander Brothers provided documents which should have been confidential so that Alstom got information about the tender which were not available to other companies. And Alexander Brothers engaged in irregular accounting. And some of the money they had were spent on lux luxurious goods, which were not probably accounted for, what happened to them. <coughs> so it was not clear what, what they did there. And again, Alstom itself had been under supervision for bribes paid previously. And that was also one of the arguments brought against them. And the state officials which had been involved in this project, some of the state officials had been largely prosecuted and fined for bribery in other projects. So in particular, in these last things, you always have to balance in my view that you should not be entitled to rely on your own behavior but that has to be to be balanced against the public interest in effectively fighting corruption. So all that has led to a development of a toolkit for arbitrators <coughs> on corruption, money laundering, international arbitration. You remember that I mentioned the PhD thesis of Catherine Betts at the Basel Center there, and outcome of that had been that toolkit where they provide arbitrations with a kind of flow chart where you can go through and say, is that available in my case? Is that, and then uh, it tells you what to do there. And the difference is to that individual cases that it addresses the issue, issue systematically. And I assume that in the future, 
we will more frequently use that toolkit um, and it, its updates, uh, which they have regular conferences there and they update it on the basis of the case law, what they've seen in the past. And there's closely related to that, to the application of the law, but also to the question of evidence, evidence and proving bribery is the question, what are the arbitrator's obligation? You remember that Judge Lagergren in his case came up putting the issue up on its own motion, ex officio in principle. And an arbitrator, you have an obligation to render a valid and enforceable award. So if there are red flags, potential red flags, even if they're not raised by the parties, do you have to do that? And one of the funny things was also in the Indian arbitration, which I, the Debas arbitration, in the arbitration, there was never a discussion about fraud. It was at the beginning during the arbitration, it was just about this termination of the contract. The allegations of fraud only came at the post award level. Yeah. And shortly before the award was rendered, we had the first report by the investigation office in, in um, <coughs> India. So do you have a duty to examine ex officio and apply mandatory provisions of the law, even if that law has not been chosen? In my view, in the future, we should move to that, that you look into that. But then we have another step. Once you have found that out, you can always, if the parties are not willing to do that, you can may step down as an arbitrator if you're not willing to engage into or being involved in these type of activities, if you're uncertain about that. Because in the end, you have to rely on what the parties provide you with. You have no uh, police powers to request documents which are not provided to you and which are not requested by the other party. You cannot force, you have no sovereign powers to force witnesses to come, whatever. So then you have a conflicting obligation from the arbitrator's contract and the duty to inform authorities. And it depends a little bit how you see your role as an arbitrator. Do you see your role as an arbitrator primary as someone hired by the parties to solve their dispute? Then you may step down, but that's it. Or that you see the role of you or your role as an arbitrator as a judge in international business. Arbitration may be the backbone of international business. And as a judge of that, you have to fight or you may have to fight corruption. And then there may be an obligation to inform the government of authorities if they're not already informed about certain issues. It's not so much bribery, it's very much involved, very much uh, money laundering where that plays a role. And now let me come to the last stage, the post-award control by the state. Um, there are a number of issues there. You have first procedural issues. You have very often time limit for annulment actions and sometimes the bribery is only proven after the uh, uh, period has expired. And sometimes you have also a stopper for new arguments. So arguments which could have been raised in an arbitration and were not raised may no, later not be raised in enforcement or setting aside proceedings. It's clear that there is no review on the merits, but it's also clear that there's always the exception of public policy. And I've included here a quote from one of the famous cases of World Duty Free versus Kenya, corruption is contrary to international public policy of most, if not all states, or to use another formula to transnational public policy. I think that is already at present beyond doubt, and in the future will definitely be the relevant standard. However, looking at the various contracts and looking also at some of the cases we have seen in the past, you may, when we deal with corruption, we may have a difference. Uh, if we have contracts which are clearly made for corruption, like the Judge Lagergren contract, or if we have contracts where we have just a contract which was obtained by corruption, and then we may have differences whether corruption was already the pre-conclusion phase, meaning I bribed someone, or whether the corruption co basically took place at the post-conclusion phase, 
when it's concerning the performance of the contract and other issues. There may be, there may be relevant considerations for tribunals, but primary for courts at the post-award stage. And when you look at the jurisprudence, you have some indications of that, that the Alstom courts looked into these questions and said there had been no intention, definitely no intention by Alstom, at least what has been alleged is that subsequently the Alexander brothers used the money they obtained by the contract to bribe the uh, Chinese officials. And there's another question which may arise, and again, which may also come up in the future. Again, Judge Lagergren in the past said, however, before invoking good morals and public policy as barring parties from recourse to judicial arbitrary instances in settling their dispute, care must be taken to see, to see that one party is not thereby enabled to reap the fruits of his own dishonest conduct by enriching itself at the expense of others. He was looking at that from the jurisdictional side. But again, let's assume for a moment that in the Alstom case, the contract was really concluded between Alexander Brothers and Alstom to bribe Chinese officials. Now Alexander Brothers brings a claim for payment of the money due under that contract. Alstom invokes it, but Alstom has benefited from that contract already. Due to that contract, they have received what they wanted. They have re three, received the three Chinese contracts. So now preventing, or basically ordering, or preventing payment there, Alstom is benefiting from its own con conduct, which is immoral. And there's an issue where, which we have to address in the future as well. How do we deal appropriately with that? Primarily probably through state sanctions there. But on the other hand, and that is something when we look at also the state, the last point I wanted to mention, the standard of review, you have to keep one thing in mind. The allegations of corruption and bribery may also be an easy way for parties to get out of contracts they're unhappy with. And looking at the Devas Azurix case, when you look at some of the allegations raised subsequently, uh, the fraud allegations, whatever, to an outsider not involved in that case, the Devas operation may have been perfectly fine. A new company special purpose vehicle set up for one particular venture there with in the back shareholders who have been doing that business all the time. Deutsche Telekom is operating these type of services in Germany and other jurisdictions. Yeah, so one of the central arguments in the Devas case was Devas was a company which was not existing at the time. They entered into this high value contract, provided promised its services they could not render because they didn't have the means and the facilities. But if the subsidiary can bring the means and facilities easily, you have to ask yourself whether that is not okay. So there is an issue here in, in that regard. And when you look at the standard of review, which is also one of the issues which we are we discussing presently is, as a court, are you engaging in a full review? And I think we have now reached a standard that at least according to the application of the law, you engage in a full review. But the most important part and that comes back to the issue of evidentiary problems is what happens to the determination of facts? Do I engage in an entire de novo review or am I engaging only in a limited review? Limited review, and if I engage in a limited review, what type of limitations are there? Can I only look at the facts once more if I prove that the arbitral tribunal violated procedural rules in establishing the facts? Or can I look also into <coughs> the facts if there are other indications that arguments may not have really evaluated properly by the arbitral tribunal? 
there would be a number of other issues which I could discuss what happens with the related belated discovery. We have a tendency now to allow revisions. That means, yes, we have on the one hand, the principle of ratio di carta of awards, but we have now in Swiss arbitration law, a provision, clear provision, which says, whenever there is evidence found of bribery subsequently, you may review the decisions rendered in the enforcement section or in the setting aside proceedings. And the new German law is also discussing including comparable things. But even if you don't have it included in the law, there's an interesting decision by a German court where they looked the a provision of substantive law to basically force a party to hand out or to give out or basically return the award it has received. And they relied on that. And the provision says a person who in a manner contrary to public policy intentionally inflicts damages on another person, meaning I basically concealed documents. I defrauded the arbitrators by not providing proper documents and thereby brought inflicted damages on the award debtor because they couldn't prove that bribery that gives me a claim under substantive law for return of the award to me and thereby making it non-enforceable. And as I said, there is also the issue because very often states are involved, but that is definitely too important for short treatment at the end. That is for an entirely different uh, lecture. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kroll, for an interesting lecture. It was very engaging. Uh, so maybe as an organizer, let me take the benefit of asking question first. <laughs> uh, you mentioned about burden of proof, standard of proof, uh, something between beyond reasonable doubt, uh, but less than full conviction. And then there was this also case where the standard of proof was clear and convincing. Usually a very high standard of proof we use in criminal cases. So the argument in favor of using high standard of proof is that there are allegations which are of criminal in nature. But arbitrator is not investing, investigating those allegations. Ultimately, arbitrator is deciding whether there is a remedy to be given under the contract or not. His decision will be on the contract whether one party is entitled to the remedy or not entitled to the remedy. So if that be the case, shouldn't the standard of proof be still balance of probabilities? As I said, I'm clear that beyond reasonable doubt is not the relevant standard for these type of um, right. of allegations. Yeah, they're serious allegations, but as you rightly said, we are not in a criminal case. Yeah, um, and we also do not have the investigative powers which the authorities have. Yeah, which deal with the criminal cases. So balance of probabilities means fifty one percent. Right. It is still a serious allegation. Yeah, and um, and with that serious allegation, I would require a little bit more than fifty-one percent. Yeah, in a way that I would say there should be preponderance of evidence, and given that is is um, and preponderance is a little bit more than the balance of probabilities uh, in a way, and also because. Easily, these uh, allegations of corruptions are also abused. Yeah, I think there is hardly any major investment case in certain areas. Yeah, where not the first thing they rise uh, is, yeah, it's the uh, allegation that there was corruption involved. Yeah, and um, as I said, again, it's also very difficult. Yeah, to draw a clear line or between corruption. And, it's it's easy to draw a clear line between corruption and um, trafficking of uh, influence, but 
we have a lot of gray areas, yeah. And in the end, if we have the burden of proof on one party, they have engaged in that contract. There is always the question of uh, also Pacta Sunt Servanda issues, yeah. So I would have not balance of probabilities, but a little bit, little bit stricter one preponderance of evidence, yeah. So, in but India, also not the full conviction case, yeah, which is. For example, applied in in some jurisdictions as the normal standard. Yeah. Uh, in India, term balance of probability and preponderance of probability are used interchangeably. So, just a fact. Then you mentioned about some red flags, and in the red flags, the issues were bribery in other projects. Then. Uh, th there were some other relevant factors, but the primary emphasis was to show the character of the person. And usually, generally in the national evidence law, we bar character evidence. The fact must be proved by its own, the case must be proved by its own facts and by not relying on what a person might have done in some other cases or what his general conduct might be. Because the evidence of general character is usually not admissible. So can we say that the standards of evidence on this point in international arbitration are different? Um, first of all, we are talking about companies primarily here. Yeah? So how they behaved in, uh, in the past, that also sh tells you a little bit how the company is structured. Yeah, What are the ethical rules in the company? Um, the it's more that they say, is it likely? It's a question not, they're not taking anything about your character, but it's a question of likelihood. And that's the problem with all this uh, indirect evidence. Yeah, you take certain indices and then draw conclusions by adding them up. Yeah, so that is more, as I said, the likelihood that that has happened. Yeah, but again, I said the problem in the Alstom case was Alstom would have benefited from its bad behavior yeah, uh, in the past yeah, by saying, okay, I'm not paying the <laughs> promised money now. Um, I think again that the, uh, and that's one of the advantage of international arbitration, the national evidentiary rules are normally not applicable in international arbitration. In international arbitration, it's for the arbitrator to determine the weight of evidence, at least under most laws. I'm not familiar with the with the Indian law, but uh, at least under the Ansatron model law, it's the arbitrator determining the balance on the, the weight Correct. given to particular evidence. Yeah. In, in, in India also, the principles of the evidence act are applicable, but the act is not applicable. We can derive yeah. the principle. So that was my question. Uh, coming to Elsom case, uh, so we were talking about arbitrability and should it matter that, and you also mentioned about three kinds of corruption, contracts obtained by corruption, payment to third party by intermediaries and corrupted arbitral proceeding. Within that context, can we argue that cases where the purpose of the contract is corruption, like the Elstom case, the purpose of the contract was corruption, then those contracts are not enforceable. Whereas other kind of cases wherein there might be an allegation of corruption, they are still arbitrable. Because at least in Indian Contract Act, we say if the purpose of the contract is illegal, such contract is not enforceable, what uh, the judge uh, La Liga was also mentioning about, yeah. I, I believe. No, but that was the, the issue. What was illegal there was the purpose of the main contract. Yeah, that means that contract is clearly invalid and you cannot enforce it. That would be enforcing it would be against public policy. But the question was, does that also render the arbitration agreement contained in that contract immediately illegal? Yeah. And there we have the doctrine of separability. And unless the Indian courts would say, OK, every illegal contract which has an arbitration clause, also the arbitration clause is tainted by illegality then I would say you have the doctrine of separability and you have to ask yourself, is the arbitration in itself legal? For example, because I really wanted, the only purpose of arbitration was to evade 
the light of the public. Yeah. Uh, but if there are other reasons, yeah, if they always go, Alstom goes in most of their cases to arbitration, yeah, because it's their selected means of dispute resolution. But let's take the example of a company which never goes to arbitration and only in this one particular contract goes to arbitration. You could argue also the arbitration agreement as such is tainted by illegality. The contract, I'm entirely with you. Yeah, that is clearly illegal if it's for paying bribes. And that's what I also wanted to show on that one picture where I said it may make a difference whether you had illegality before, whether the contract as such is illegal or it's just illegality after you use the proceeds of that one contract to engage in illegal behavior. Right. Yeah. Correct. And then there are cases where, where you as rightly mentioned, identifying corruption is very difficult. Those are borderline consultancy agreements or probably corporate might be directly funding the political party which cannot be labeled as a corruption, but because you are funding a political party, you can get a government contract. That, uh, that is one of the really problematic issues there. Yeah, on the one hand, and also with the when we look at the the um, financial and personal resources of an entity. Yeah, if I have two very influential people. Yeah, if I have, for example, let's take a name, Elon Musk. He gets other things done by himself yeah by having him as my uh, basically agent then if i have an entity uh, with 300 people who don't know the right persons yeah so also that is as they're just right flags which on the other hand makes arbitration so interesting yeah because then it all depends on on the arbitrator to some extent yeah um how they deal with those red flags and how they deal um what experience they have in these type of jurisdictions. Right. Um, my last question is, you mentioned about duty to inform authorities. Uh, you, you kind of raised a question and in ancestral model law, as well as Indian Arbitration Act, uh, Article 27 talks about court can take, uh, arbitrator can take assistance of court. Can we say, or can we at least try to bridge this argument that I'm, I'm just taking the assistance of the court and then the court can take necessary action as far as corruption is concerned in, in such kind of matters. That would be the easy way out yeah? in a way where I say, okay, as an arbitrator, I have sometimes investigative powers as well. Yeah. So if the parties allege something uh, and under some laws I have as an arbitrator, I can request the court, please help me with that. Yeah. And with that request already indicate there is an issue here and then leave it to the court to inform the criminal, uh, the prosecution offices. Yeah, um, that is definitely something, but also something as an arbitrator, you have to take into account Yeah, whether you're not, if that is the sole purpose of your request to the court, whether that is not a breach of your arbitrator's contract. Yeah, and as I said, that is also a very open field. Yeah. What is the role? How what? How do you see your role as an arbitrator? Yeah, uh, do I have? I'm clearly not a judge in a particular state, but do I have a kind of obligation towards the international community? And we had that discussion, for example, with the binding, uh, with the uh, in investment arbitration. What is the purpose of an investment award? Am I just deciding that particular case, or am I developing? also the entire system of uh, investment protection. And again, I have to write, put in different considerations into my award. This takes us to which theory of arbitration or school of arbitration you, you subscribe to. Yeah. yeah. So let, let's come to question and answers in the Q&A box. Uh, would you also like to pursue yourself? Um, yeah, First question is, what are the acts of corruption in international arbitration by Nainalini? So how do we define corruption? Complicated question. I would just try to rely on the various definitions you find in the, in the, um, in the statutes and other things which you have to apply. Uh, um, as I said, let's in principle already take the uh, trading in influence in some jurisdiction that is clearly prohibited yeah because they have a serious problem with corruption and have 
you don't you're not even allowed to have consultancy agreements if you participate in a public tender yeah you have to sign that you have no there's no consultant involved whatever it's just you and um but there is no generally accepted corruption yeah for me corruption is in principle you pay someone for something uh that he does something which would he would not do yeah without that payment uh, and which is contrary to his obligations otherwise existing yeah right uh, i think mohammed faisal's question you have already addressed during your lecture the question yeah. is if the parent contract is obtained by corruption and it's void ab initio what is the point of establishing tribunal jurisdiction on that contract and what will be the role of tribunal if the contract is itself void the tribunal will determine whether the contract is void yeah that is one of the issues which is always controversial there's always the mere fact that someone brings an action shows that this party believes the contract is valid and gives it a claim so that is what you get the tribunal for yeah to determine whether the contract is void whether corruption has existed yeah but i'm glad that some people always or also speak german he starts with guten tag yeah, yeah. so minalini she again asks a question which was indirectly addressed by you how do we establish legal and factual causation in the absence of established procedure of evidence in arbitration how do we establish legal and factual causation in the absence of established procedure of evidence in arbitration arbitrator de devises his own procedure yeah that's to some extent uh well, you, have, you rely on 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 what you're trained in yeah and uh that's also in principle everyone is influenced a little bit by its own legal system yeah and uh so you're trained in the indian system probably you approach a dispute slightly different than i would approach it yeah being trained in the german system right mm. uh. being a serious allegation if not proof does it amount to defamation in principle i would say yes yeah uh, if you normally the parties are happy if they are done with it yeah uh, but in a lot of these cases yeah uh, you see the full arsenal yeah uh, that you see criminal cases initiated you have uh, interpol search uh, interpol warrants against uh, against investors whatever yeah so when you in particular when you involved in investment arbitration yeah sometimes looking at what the states do also to investors yeah it's reads like a crime story yeah so yeah in my view alleging that someone engaged in bribery is a serious allegation and would in my view justify defamation right if done so in public think, uh, uh, the next question anonymous question you have uh, addressed it while discussing with me uh, whether arbitration act excludes evidence act so and yeah. there are more and more questions flowing and that's why while drafting it do we need to specifically draft the detailed clause relating to this issue is it a best practice to address corruption related issue in the arbitration agreement itself i i would be surprised if one of the my counterparties in a uh, contract negotiations suggests that we include arbitration or we exclude it yeah um that could also also be something yeah if you want to say uh, i'm i i'm not dealing with corruption cases in in arbitration then you have to exclude it yeah that's a little bit the uh jurisprudence there of the european court of justice in this anti um uh, in this post carter damage cases where they said yeah, in the end arbitration you make a deliberate decision to submit certain disputes to arbitration you only had in mind disputes which normally arise under contract you normally expect the other party not to engage in bribery yeah of someone therefore you never had in mind to submit these disputes to arbitration um that argument will be run i'm pretty sure yeah in in the future more frequently and the counter argument is in principle you want to submit everything and you don't really think about uh particular disputes kept out 
if my memory serves correct, whether investor state arbitration, uh, BIT, some of them do they have they have some something on corruption. Yeah. They had very often that they only protect legal investment, yeah, and that means if they only protect legal investment, yeah, that means if the investment is not protected, yeah, uh, that on the one hand it is uh, an issue of substance, but at the same time. Uh, only the investment covering or covered by the BIT is also benefiting from the jurisdictional clause. Yeah? And so therefore, you may right. not even have jurisdiction. So in the interest of time, let me skip through some question. And let's take this question from Chin Mei. Thank you for this lecture, Professor. My question pertains to the corrupted arbitrable proceedings. Please do correct me if I'm wrong at any point, but there have been speculations that in some international commercial arbitration, interested third parties indulge betting on the outcome of arbitration. Could this be considered as part of the corrupted arbitrable proceeding? And if yes, what can be the toolkit for arbitrators to deal with such case? And I would say whether this betting is third party funding, <laughs> that I wouldn't call that. Yeah, you can call it betting. Yeah, to some extent. Yeah, they invest in in others. Yeah. Um, again, there's a huge discussion concerning third party funding. Yeah, and third party funding for a long time had a very negative attitude or very negative reputation. Yeah, in particular because it was always said investor state arbitration. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that is justified. Yeah. Um, we are now presently discussing third party funding uh, in consumer cases yeah, due to access to justice issues. And in my view, the, the cases I have seen, yeah, I've, I've been involved in cases where the third party funder got it wrong. Yeah, uh, and they withdrew within with the middle in the middle of the case. Yeah, they withdrew, no more funding. Yeah, uh, and you knew from that time onwards, OK, there is a serious issue here. In my view, you have, they're the only persons who have only a financial interest in the outcome yeah, of a case. And the financial interest involves not only you have to win the case, but also in the end, you have to be able to enforce it subsequently. So they're looking at that without any emotions, just money-wise. And if they come to the conclusion, say, we want to invest it, there are a number of issues. I remember we had five, six years ago, we had, uh, the issue of third party funding in the Wismut case. And we had a conference in, in Hamburg discussing third party funding. And it was all about access to justice. And my wife, she's an accountant. Yeah, she was coming to that conference there as well, was sitting in the in the lecture, and in the end she came to me and said, Why, why do you only talk about that? Uh, for me, that is just ordinary risk hatching in a company. Yeah? I have a certain risk. I have a litigation arbitration risk, yeah, which I want to hatch, even if there's no, no um, access to justice involved, even as a major company. If you say an arbitration may cost me 25 million, I may want to hatch against that risk. Yeah? Uh, and that standard risk. So there are different things. I wouldn't be as critical. I wouldn't consider third party funding as a corrupt practice. Naturally, you also have cases where the third party funder may be involved in a case yeah which in the end is a based on a corrupt contract but they may be they also have to rely most of the time on the information they get and they make a decision say there is no corruption yeah because normally the claimant is not alleging corruption corruption only comes in when the respondent brings its defense or perhaps the respondent in the course of an arbitration finds out that there have been payments made which are unexplainable or whatsoever. Yeah? Right. Uh, can we indulge with you for five more minutes and take one or two more I'm, questions? I enjoy teaching and I enjoy answering questions. Yeah, so, yeah, so Kostub has an interesting question which he has posted at least six, seven times. What happens when there are allegations of corruption and crimes against humanity in a case being heard at International Criminal Court and a key witness involved in an arbitration process is affected by these allegations, will the arbitral tribunal halt the proceedings? That's a very easy question. It depends. 
Uh, so it really depends on the allegations. It really depends on the issues. We frequently have that in arbitration proceedings. We have frequently have that request. Yeah, and if I was someone who wants to employ guerrilla tactics, that would be something I would do. Yeah, uh, bring a corruption allegations, whatever, and then always ask for a stay. So again, it depends really on the specific facts of the case. There, I have a in front. I have a strong, strong view. Uh, justice delayed is justice denied. Yeah, and unless there, you can give me good reasons why I should wait. Yeah, uh, I'm willing to run the risk. Yeah, in the end, to render a decision. Yeah, unless I have myself serious doubt that something is problematic. Yeah. We have seen so many witnesses put under pressure by these type of things. Yeah. Um, Exactly. I would just do that, get the things done. Yeah. Right. And in, a, in any case, a award could be set aside if yeah. later on it is found. It's, it's better to continue with the proceedings. And both the proceedings can always happen parallelly. What prevents yeah. it? But again, there may be political so sensitive cases that you better wait Yeah, in a way. Otherwise, you damage. Uh, damage arbitration um, in, in a particular region as well, yeah? Or you do other things which, which are even worse than having to stay your arbitration for another six, seven months, yeah? And standard of proof is different in both these cases. So while there might be acquittal before international criminal court against the very same party, there could be an adverse award. Yeah. Because of the different standard of proof. Uh, so then the question is about the red flags you mentioned. And one of the red flag was pervasiveness of corruption in the host state. Has it ever been referred to formally by a tribunal in its award? I would be surprised if not. Yeah, I've seen a number of cases where it was raised and where it definitely had influenced the tribunal in its award, but that they say that is the crucial evidence or whatever. Yeah, it, it's one of the factors resulting in the decision. Yeah, in some of the decisions, uh, the world, the Kenya, yeah, duty free thing, yeah, they are clear about the level of corruption in Kenya. Yeah, and, um, in fact, there are many investor state arbitration involving Latin American countries, yeah. uh, Mexico, Argentina, wherein these kind of references have been made. Where does toolkit derive its authority from so that there are better chances of enforcement? Um. Then I may have been misunderstood. For me, it was just a question of um, how do we improve the approach of an arbitrator? Uh, uh, if you have a piecemeal approach of all arbitrators, I know a number of cases, you know a number of cases, someone else knows a number of cases. If we have a group which have put these cases together yeah, and has a much broader view on certain things and has developed that, into a systematic approach and they really have a flow chart yeah where they ask you several questions um which you should go through to determine whether there's corruption or not i think that improves the result and if i in the end can say i have as an arbitrator right in my award according to the various points i've looked at yeah uh, i have uh, not found any corruption that may influence also subsequently court at a setting aside or enforcement stage saying okay there's someone who has taken the allegation of corruption seriously and has gone through all that yeah and has seen all the witnesses and has done what could be do done yeah so i may be more willing to trust that person that also they evaluated the evidence provided in a proper way right i i think we will just take last two questions uh, one is corruption tainted awards. Should national court take a tribunal finding at face value or should it investigate further to come to its own conclusion? And that's one of the, uh, the, the problematic parts. For me, if there are allegations, serious allegations of corruptions and there are um, uh, also arguments that they have not been raised before the tribunal, uh, whatever, 
I would say a court should go get engaged in that, yeah, because that is such a serious allegation. In principle, I would, however, say if we have arbitrators who have evaluated all that, addressed that properly in their award, uh, I would have a certain trust in that they get it done properly. Uh, so, but again, it's a question, it depends. I would not say that the courts are prevented in looking at the facts again, but I would expect them to do that if there's a serious allegation and their grounds why they have the impression that the arbitrator got it somehow wrong. Right. And the last question which I would like to take is what happens when there are allegations of corruption? No, no not this one. Uh, sir, some time ago, read about EU countries amending their energy policies in regard to climate crisis. This has created conflicts with foreign investors in this area. Are member nations obliged to review and review an arbitration award in this sector? That's one of the most controversial issues. If you would ask me, I would say arbitration has protected the fossil industry, but it's now protecting primarily the investment the, in renewables. When you look at the cases, yeah, uh, the majority of cases brought over the last six years is renewables. Yeah, uh, Governments having uh, not lived up to their promises for investors on renewables. Um, in my view, uh, the European Union has a is damaging the international system by trying to get out of these these awards. Yeah, um, <clears throat> whenever you look at the whenever you look at it from the perspective of European law only, there's a hierarchy that European law is above everything. Yeah. But whenever you look at the broader picture, yeah, you have a hierarchy that I would say um, we have to protect the international system, and the international system is dependent on arbitration, in particular in these type of cases. Yeah, um, and I cannot understand the European Union. Yeah, to be honest. Yeah, and yeah. but don't get me going. Yeah, I would uh, spend yeah. another hour here yeah, discussing these issues. Uh, Romil is a student of our postgraduate diploma, and. Yeah. By background, he's a journalist. Yeah, so yeah. let, let um, me invite him to speak and maybe Romil, you can also thank the faculty for today's session. Romil, I have allowed you to speak. If you can please thank the faculty for today's lecture and we can close the session. Okay, but you must... Yeah, uh, hello, am I audible? You are audible. You are audible. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, uh, Stephen, sir, uh, this was indeed a very, uh, personally, I would say, very fulfilling session uh, because, uh, as uh, Chirak sir said, I am not a lawyer. I don't have a law background, but uh, yes, I, uh, as a journalist, I have covered a lot of international events. And so this was the back of my mind. Uh, so, having said that, I think. Uh, as a vote of thanks, I would like to thank you on behalf of uh, NLU Mumbai. And uh, it was indeed a pleasure having you on. I hope we can uh, uh, have a similar session with you sometime in the near future. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Good thank time. you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me and for staying on for so long. Yeah? Pleasure. Thank you so much, Professor Stephen Darshna. Would you like to say a final Bye to sir from your side. Thankful session, especially when you touch the various dimensions, and then uh, you went with the evidentiary problems. And even I had a, a doubt when it were like Chirak sir asked with respect to criminal law that balance of probabilities, but then it got cleared when you uh, answered Chirak sir's question. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you from uh, on behalf of MNLU Mumbai. We, we generally say MNLA Mumbai Parivar. Parivar means family in Hindi. So thank you so much, sir, uh, for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to have more associations with you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure okay. hosting this session. Thank you thank so you much. much. And I hope to see many of you at the Bismuth then. Yeah? Definitely. <laughs> Bye. Bye.